morning and welcome back to Hop and Bowl Morning Devotion. We are glad that you joined in this morning. Praise God for all the blessings that God has been showering upon our lives, especially in times like this. And it's a beautiful thing to come together and give Him thanks. Can we look to the Lord and say a word of prayer? Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful morning that we could be well and alive in your presence, Lord Father, because of your grace. That we could look to you, respond to you, worship you, Lord. We pray that you'll speak to our hearts this morning, Lord. We come in the rest of the service in your mighty hands. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Can we lift up our praise unto the King, for he alone is worthy. Amen. Yo 
Thank you for your name is worthy, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for this wonderful day, for giving us this opportunity to humble ourselves in your presence. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings and for your provisions and protection over our household. Even in these troubled times when many are sick and many have lost their homes and in the midst of all the financial instabilities, Lord, you have provided for us, Lord. You have been our Jehovah Jireh. Help us to stay focused and to put our faith in you, Appa. Lord, our help comes from you, who is the creator of heaven and earth. Your word says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Abba, help us to always seek your will in our lives, to fulfill your purposes in our life. Help us not to be distracted by the events around us, not to be confirmed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewal of our mind, so that we may understand the perfect will of our Father in our life. Jesus, help us not to be self-deceived. Help us to continuously examine ourselves to see if we are in faith. In these trying times, give us your grace to be your faithful stewards, to use our talents in whichever way possible apart to glorify your name. Lord, give us a burden in our heart to pray for those in darkness, for people in our family, for our near and dear ones. Give us a heart to intercede and pray continuously, Appa. We surrender ourselves before you, Lord. Mold us and help us to be kind and compassionate and loving. Jesus, help us to have a true relationship with you, Lord. Not to have a namesake Christian life, but to have a Christ-centered life, to listen to your voice and to be doers of your word and not just listeners. Lord, we know that the time is near, Appa. Help us to be faithful to your calling till the end. In faith, we believe and we pray for a revival in our country, Lord. We pray that your church will wake up and together in unison, we'll pray for the people of India. We pray for our pastors and the missionary families who are preaching in different parts of India, Appa. Bless them all, Lord. We give them unto you, Appa. Let your peace be upon this land, Appa. Bless our country, Appa. Thank you, Lord, for giving us an opportunity to study about the heroes of the Bible as we are going to hear from your word, Lord. Open our hearts. Let the word transform us, Appa. Everything we ask in the most precious and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. We greet you all in the name of Jesus. Hope you are all doing great. God has inspired me today to speak from the story of Noah. Before even I start, I would like to ask you a blatant question. How many of you really believe that a simple, unschooled, primitive man called as Noah built an ark of epic proportions and gathered a pair of every living creature and fed them, housed them securely, and disclosed all their ways for a period of almost one year? Are you out of your mind to believe this? Really? There are a lot of paleontological evidences. There are a lot of ancient civilizations which has recorded a flood of this magnitude. A lot of legends do say about a flood in almost the same era, the Old Testament biblical times. These are not the reasons why we believe it. 
the story of Noah? We believe it because of the God said so. We know from 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is God breathed. That settles it. Furthermore, Jesus has validated Noah's story in Matthew 24 and Luke 17. You just imagine way back in 2350 BC, God approaches Noah, tells him, Noah, I'm going to inundate the whole of planet Earth with a massive flood and exterminate every living creature on the face of Earth. I want you to build an ark 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet tall with gopher wood. And I want you to catch hold of a pair each of every land animal, every bird there, and all reptiles, and put them in the ark. And I want you and your family to feed them, to keep them for a year. Time. Now, what would have been Noah's reply to God? Used to run bonkers, right? If I were in this place, I would have probably said, God, you speak kidding. But no, I didn't say that. And that's our talking point for the day. I just want to pick just three points from Noah's story, Noah's life, for the learning today. The first aspect of Noah's life worth pondering upon is Noah's testimony. Let's turn to Genesis 6 6. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. What a profound statement is that. The creator of heaven and earth regrets for having created the only ones who were made in his own image. And remember, man's creation was the pivotal of all creation. Even during Gen Genesis 3, we do not see God expressing such regrets during the fall, fall of Adam and Eve. So Noah's time would have witnessed the heights of human depravity. But two verses ahead, in, in Genesis 6, 9, let's see what God says. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. What a testimony is that. You could be the only believer in your class or among your friends. You could be the only believer in your office or your project team. You could be the only believing family in your whole apartment complex. Here many of us could find ourselves in compromising situations. But let's not forget the example of Noah. Noah was a just man, not just in his class or office or his apartment. He was the only just man on planet Earth. And the God of the universe came to testify for him. Now how is that? So brothers and sisters, no matter how challenging our circumstances are, we do not have an excuse for losing our good testimonies. So how did Noah manage to lead a life of such testimony? The answer lies in the same verse, Genesis 6, 9. Noah walked with God. Let me tell you, church, every good testimony around us is a result of walking with God. Now, without exercising this walk with God, the best one could master is to cook up a good person image this is going to blow up someday. Remember, Jesus referred to such people as whitewashed tombs. So let's decide to walk a life with God. And you betcha, God is anxiously waiting to hold your hand and take a stroll with you. The second aspect of Noah's life which we will look into today is Noah's valor. Now, How did this man build an ark of such epic proportions? What was his engineering prose? Did he have a master's in naval architecture from MIT or Princeton? What was the scale and size of his project? To give you an understanding of the size of Noah's Ark, let's compare this to a cricket stadium. It was pretty much the size of a cricket stadium. Now what exactly was Noah's Ark? It was essentially a ship without a propulsion system, designed to carry cargo, lots of cargo, and freely floating on water. Now to give you a perspective, of the magnanimity of its design, I'll quote two examples. The first Iron Maid ship to cross the Atlantic was SS Great Britain, which was made in 1844. It was designed to ferry between Bristol and New York. 
this was a passenger steamer and this was designed with the ratios of Noah's Ark. It was a legendary ship and it's today a museum. When I say it has taken the ratios, it doesn't mean the dimensions are the same. It just means that it has the same ratios of its, of its construction as that of Noah's Ark. Secondly, the Liberty ships of the United States, which were a class of cargo ships used during the Second World War. They are one of the most successful cargo ships to have been built till date. 2,710 numbers of Liberty ships were, were made to a single design. And this is the largest number of ships made to a single design till date. This was a big success too. This speaks volumes of the impeccable design of Noah's Ark. Now how did Noah pull this off? The answer lies in Genesis 16.22. Let's look into it. This Noah did according to all that God commanded him. So he did. So what does that mean? Noah did this task or he built the ship by being micro-instructed by God. God instructed him to build the ship plank by plank, nail by nail. But does God interact with man so intensely? Does he do it even today? Of course, why not? He is the same as today, today and forever. This reminds me of an interaction I've had with a missionary in Shimla. This is a young missionary couple. They hail from Kerala, very affluent families that they come from, highly educated abroad. They responded to the call of God and went to a remote village close to Shimla. Now for their sustenance, they started baking cakes. And knowing that they do not have any background related to baking cakes, they had nothing to do with it. So I was so curious and I asked them, how do you manage to make such upmarket cakes from such a remote location in Shimla? This is what he told me. He learned the basics of baking from the internet and he sources his supplies of fine ingredients from Chandigarh, which is pretty far from Shimla. And for his recipes, he sits with God. This is what he said. Go back him. He goes to his prayer room, reads the scripture, prays and meditates and God gives him ideas for his recipe. Then he gets back to his production tries out these new recipes. If he gets stuck somewhere, he stops there, he goes back to his scriptures, starts reading and meditating again, and God further leads him with the recipe. He gets back. And that's how he comes up with innovative products. Bingo! That's news to me. I'm also involved with baking for a living. But I never knew God's scripture could serve as a recipe book. Later, I shared this with my executive chef. Today he uses this technique to come out with new recipes, new products. You could be an average student. You could be a mediocre performer in your office. You could be a businessman at the brink of bankruptcy. But if you commit your vocations to God's purpose, He will make you do great and mighty things. If God doesn't require a team of skilled, brilliant naval engineers and rather used a naive, untrained man like Noah, to build the most crucial and the most important marine vessel in the history of shipbuilding. He doesn't require prodigies to create epics. He could use average people like you and me to accomplish things beyond our wildest imagination. But there is a caveat. We shouldn't try to fit our desires into God's purpose. Rather, we should surrender our desires to God so as to make it fit according to his purpose for our lives. So let's see God's purposes for our lives to become mighty shipbuilders in our classes, in our offices, in our families, in our businesses and on the mission fields. The third aspect of Noah's life for our study is Noah's faith. Let's read from Genesis chapter 7 verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, 
because I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. See, God calls Noah righteous in this generation and he invites Noah and his family to enter the ark. So what does this mean? This means that Noah and his family receive salvation. Dear brothers and sisters, we know that the entry into Noah's ark is a foreshadow of the salvation through Jesus Christ. So how did Noah and his family receive an entry ticket into the ark? It's not because they built the ark. It's because of their faith which was imputed as righteousness upon them. We know from the epistle to the Romans where Paul says that Abraham's faith was imputed as righteousness upon him and David was accounted righteous because of his faith. We also know from Romans that we received our salvation because of our faith and not because of our works. But Paul says in 2nd Philippians as he ask the church in Philippia to work out their own salvation. So what does this mean? It simply means that we need, to, we need to make sure that our salvation is intact by checking our works. Because true salvation would surely bring forth obedience to God's commands, which would result in good works. Here we could see Noah working out a salvation. How was that? Noah believes every word which God says and obeys his commands. A worldwide flood could have been an inconceivable thing for Noah because there was no such phenomenon called as flood at that point in time. And the command which God gave Noah was a Herculean task by any standards. Yet Noah dedicated a number of decades of his life to fulfill God's command. Hence, at the completion of Noah's ark, God accounts Noah to be a righteous man. Dear brothers and sisters, we need to test our faith through the obedience of God's commands. What was our Lord's last commandment? In Matthew 28, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now how could we honor this commandment? Not all of us could be missionaries. That's true. But we could pray for our missionaries and pastors. We could support them with the, with the blessings that God has given us. We could visit mission fields. We could share a testimony with a with neighbor. We could preach the gospel to a friend. It's all the more important today because we know that we are living in the end times. In Matthew 24, when the disciples asked Jesus for a sign of the second coming, Jesus compares the time of the second coming to the time of Noah. Let's refer to Matthew 24 verse 37 38. As the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Now what's wrong with eating, drinking and marrying? There's absolutely nothing wrong about it. Not only that, it is God who instituted eating, drinking and marrying for the nourishment, fellowship and procreation of mankind. But that's not the very purpose of God's creation of mankind. And the world around us lives as though the very purpose of our existence is eating, drinking and marrying. This is where we could lead a life according to God's purpose and be a good testimony and influence the people who are in darkness around us. I hope this study has helped you and would help you in introspecting and also in strengthening your relationship with Jesus. Thank you. Praise God for wonderful messages that we've been hearing every day about people who have gone before us, who have seen God's favor in their life, just like Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Can we all pray that in this particular season, we will also find favor in the eyes of God. Amen. Can we look to the Lord in prayer as we close for this morning?
Father Lord, we thank you for this day. As just as we heard, as no one found favor in your sight, Lord, I pray that each of us will find favor in your sight. Because each of us who have heard the message, I pray that you will continue to speak to our hearts and bless this day, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you tomorrow morning, 7 o'clock, for half an hour morning.